Over the last few weeks, we've heard about Gideon's encounter with the angel of the Lord. And through this angel, the Lord tells Gideon that he is to go and save his people, the Israelites, from the vicious Midianites who've been terrorising the land for the last seven years. Gideon brings out an offering to the Lord, places it on a rock, and the angel touches the rock with his staff, causing flames to shoot up from that rock, consuming the offering. And then the angel suddenly disappears from his sight. And then, having received this worship from Gideon, the Lord asks him to put his own house in order by destroying the idols that his father, his own father, had built and replacing them with an altar to the God of Israel. And Gideon obeys, but the expected backlash from his father and the other folk in the town doesn't happen. And instead, they begin to question why they are following these Canaanite false gods rather than the God of their ancestors. And then we see the scope of the story starting to expand again as we see Gideon starting to prepare to do what the angel had told him, to get ready to fight the Midianites. But, as we'll discover in the story today, he's still plagued by doubts. So let's hear now from Judges chapter 6, starting at verse 33. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew a trumpet summoning the Abishrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh calling them to Aram's and also into Asher, Zebulun and Naphtali so that they too went up to meet them. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. The storm clouds are gathering. Lots of the surrounding enemy nations have joined forces to attack the Israelites. They've camped in the valley of Jezreel, right in the heart of Israel. And they are probably just expecting to use that as a base to go and plunder the surrounding land without any serious opposition, much as, much as they have done for the last seven years. But this time, Gideon, inspired by the Spirit of the Lord, decides to make a stand. He blows a trumpet and his clansmen, the Abizrites, fall in behind him. They've been inspired by his example of destroying the pagan idols and replacing them with an altar to the Lord. Then Gideon sends messengers to all the northern tribes of Israel with a call to arms. And remarkably, they all respond. In fact, we'll learn in the next chapter that Gideon has assembled an army of 32,000 men. And I think there's a lesson for us. Sometimes we can feel all alone. It's us against a hostile world. But God has a habit of keeping other men and women of faith tucked away, waiting in the wings, waiting for someone to make a stand for the Lord and ready to get behind them when they do. I think we see this most spectacularly in 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah has run away from the evil queen Jezebel and, and is hiding out in a cave. He's feeling full of self-pity and he tells the Lord how the Israelites have rejected God and killed all of the other prophets, that he is the only one left who is faithful to God. And God tells him to stop feeling sorry for himself and just to get on with the job he has for him. Oh, and by the way, 
He's got 7,000 other faithful men tucked away who are ready to play their part. Sometimes if we just have the courage to do the next thing, the thing that the Lord is asking of us, we may be surprised at the help that suddenly appears from unexpected quarters. But back in Judges chapter 6, even though all of these men have come out to fight, Gideon is still worried. We'll see in the next chapter that the Midianites and their allies have much greater numbers, 135,000 men and a whole lot of camels. What will Gideon do? Well, if you remember back to week one of this series, I said that Israel was having a Bonnie Tyler moment. They needed a hero and he had to be strong and he had to be fast and he had to be fresh from the fight. Well, instead, they got Gideon. Would he rise up and lead in this heroic fashion? No, he doesn't. He wobbles and he has a Brittany Spears moment. He says to God, give me a sign. And when God obliges, Gideon's reply is, hit me, baby, one more time. Well, he doesn't exactly say that because he's, he's not looking for God to hit his name on his cell phone and call him up. But even after, after that first sign, Gideon wants one more. And he knows he's pushing it because he even says to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. And the Lord indulges him with a second sign. And both of these signs were very similar. They were tests that Gideon had devised involving a woolen fleece. The first time round, Gideon lays out a fleece on the ground overnight and he asks the Lord to make it a dry morning with no dew, but that despite this, the fleece would still be soaked with morning dew, something that wouldn't happen naturally. And so Gideon knew that this would be a sign from God to confirm that he would do what he'd previously said about using God to save Israel from, from the Midianites. And God does make it happen this way. But for reasons that aren't specified, this isn't enough for Gideon. Maybe he thought it wasn't enough of a test. Maybe he's worried that the dew on the ground had evaporated especially quickly that morning. Or maybe he just didn't like the answer he got. And so he decided to try again. Rather like the guy who loses a coin toss and suddenly wants to make it best of three. But Gideon alters the test slightly second time round. This time the ground is to be covered in dew and the fleece is to be dry. There should be absolutely no way that that would happen naturally. No way that the fleece would dry quicker than the ground. But yet again, God plays Gideon's game. This time the fleece is dry and the ground is wet. And so Gideon runs out of excuses. He really will have to go and face the Midianites, as we'll hear next week. But Gideon's approach here has led some Christians to employ a slightly similar method of seeking divine guidance. And it's often referred to as putting out a fleece. I first came across this many years ago. A couple told me um, they had been considering buying a motorbike. They went to see one. They liked the look of it. But to their credit, they wanted to do the right thing by God. Did he want them to buy this motorbike or not? So they decided to, in their own words, put out a fleece. But the test they devised was this. They said, Lord, if you want us to buy this motorbike, we pray it's still there when we come back to the shop tomorrow. And if that's not what you want for us, we ask you to ensure that it's not there tomorrow. And I have to say, I've got some major issues with that approach to seeking God's guidance. Firstly, I would want to say that just because people did something in the Bible, it doesn't automatically make it the right thing to do. Now, if God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit did something, then it must be a good thing. But everyone else you'll meet in the Bible is a flawed human being who makes mistakes. As we said in a sermon a few weeks ago, even the best Bible heroes 
had feet of clay. We need to look at their actions within the wider context of scripture to determine if they are prescriptive, i.e. we should be trying to follow them, or whether the actions are merely descriptive, descriptive, telling us what happened, but not implying that we should do likewise. And secondly, I don't think this little test settles things quite as decisively as you might think. So to go back to the motorbike example, if it is still there in the morning, does that definitely mean that God wants you to have it? Or could it simply mean that God doesn't want to play your little game? Now suppose the bike isn't there. Well, I guess that's pretty clear guidance that God doesn't want you to have that particular motorbike. But it then leaves open the question. Is God saying that he doesn't want you to have a motorbike at all? Or just that he has a different one lined up for you? And thirdly, and most importantly, this little test involves us dictating terms to God. We are telling the ruler of heaven and earth how he should arrange things just to suit us, that he has to take part in this test that we've devised if he wants us to obey him. Surely that can't be right. So all in all, I really wouldn't recommend this sort of approach as a method of seeking God's will. And in Gideon's situation, he really didn't need to use that fleece. He was already very clear about what God was asking him to do. The angel of the Lord had told him. And Gideon even reminds God of this. Look at what he says. If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised. And later he says, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. So he's not really looking for guidance about what to do. He's questioning whether God will follow through on what he said. And on that basis, God would have been entitled to give Gideon a very severe rebuke, especially as he had already given Gideon a very dramatic sign, the fire leaping from the rock to consume the offering and then the subsequent disappearance of the angel. And you could say that the way his father and the local townspeople rejected their idols after Gideon destroyed the, the Baal altar and the Asherah pole, and then the success of Gideon's attempts to recruit an army, could also be signs that he is going in the right direction. But despite all this, Gideon still doesn't have confidence in the Lord doing what he said he would do. And so he actually asks for two more signs. But... God chooses to be merciful to Gideon and decides to play along with him. He understood the enormity of the situation that Gideon was facing. Because although Gideon has an army of 32,000, he is still outnumbered four to one. If the Lord isn't with him in the subsequent battle, he will be leading these men into a massacre. It's a very pressured situation for him. And what's more, Gideon has only really started to get going in his faith a few days ago. Before that, he had some awareness of God. He'd heard the stories from long ago of how God had rescued his people from Egypt and given them the promised land. But he didn't really trust the Lord. And so God indulges Gideon and his, fee and his fleece. And he has at times indulged some more modern Christians who've tried to ask guide, who have tried to ask God to guide them through similar methods. But in the time we've got left this morning, I'd like to suggest some better ways of seeking God's guidance. And I've got five methods, all beginning with the letter S. Firstly, we have scripture. The Bible is very clear that some things are sinful. So worshiping other gods besides the Lord or committing murder or adultery or theft are, are clearly not things that God wants us to do in any circumstances. That's there in black and white clearly for us to read. But the Bible also offers us clear principles to help guide us even when it's not so clear on the specifics. We are to love God and to love our neighbours. So if we're trying to weigh up different courses of action, we could ask ourselves, well, which is the most loving thing to do? 
Sometimes, though, we need to dig a bit deeper to find relevant principles. So let's return to that example of, of whether or not to buy a motorbike. The Bible doesn't say anything directly about motorbikes. Well, that said, a few years ago, I remember a minister explained to me that Moses clearly owned a motorcycle because the roar of his triumph could be heard over all of Israel. Except that last night, when I turned to my concordance to find that verse, I discovered it's not actually in the Bible, even in the old King James, which just goes to show that even if someone quotes an obscure quote from the Bible to you, even if they are a minister, you should always look it up for yourself to be sure. If you've got an online Bible, it can make it much easier to do that. Anyway, even if Moses didn't own a motorcycle, we do see that people in the Bible use the transportation methods that were available to them in that day and age. Jesus used a boat and a donkey, for example. So using a motorbike to get from A to B may well be okay. But in 1 Timothy chapter 9, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says that he wants women to dress modestly, adorning themselves with good deeds rather than expensive clothes. So on that basis, and using that kind of principle, you could say that if your primary motivation for getting a motorbike is to have a very expensive fashion accessory, something just to make you look good, then it's probably not something the Lord wants you to purchase. But if it will help you do good deeds, then that is a different story. At my former church, we, we had a guy who was part of the God Squad Christian Motorcycle Club. And owning a motorbike gave him opportunity to witness to people in the biker community. See, hopefully you get what I'm, I'm saying. If you dig a bit deeper and uncover some relevant principles uh, in the Bible, they may help you with a decision that you're facing. But you may not get a definitive answer from Scripture, and you may need to turn to some of the other approaches that we're going to talk about. The second one is listening to the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're a Christian, the Spirit is in you and he's at work in you. Often he works through the scriptures, bringing a Bible verse to mind just as we need it, or causing a particular word or phrase to feel like it's leaping off the page and grabbing our attention as we read the Bible. And sometimes he can bring other thoughts to our minds as well to direct us. Now, we talked about the Spirit guiding us in our service on the, the 5th of July, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, we also actually touched on it a couple of weeks ago, describing how sometimes the Spirit can give us a sense of deep inner peace when we settle on a course of action that aligns with God's will. Ultimately, we need to be praying, asking for the Spirit to guide us, and then paying attention to the thoughts and the feelings that he brings to mind. And the scriptures and the spirit are the two main ways that God guides us. But I want to briefly highlight three others. Now, the third method might seem strange given my earlier criticism of Gideon. But I do very much believe that God gives us signs to help us understand his will for us. In John's gospel, all the miracles that Jesus performs are actually called signs. They are intended to, to guide us. But although Jesus performed signs such as healing the blind, calming the storm, feeding the 5,000 and raising the dead, he absolutely refused to perform a sign when people demanded it from him. He wasn't going to be some sort of divine conjurer performing tricks on request. And the problem with putting out a fleece is that we are dictating how God should act rather than respecting his sovereignty. But God still gives us signs. We just need to be alert and spiritually tuned enough to, to see them because they'll come when, when God decides. Now, there might be something that breaks the usual, no, the usual laws of nature, as with Gideon's fleece. But often it can just be natural events occurring at a time or in a way that has significance for us. One very quick example. Many years ago, Janie and I had felt that the Lord was asking us to move church. 
to go from the Anglican church in which we'd met to a Church of Scotland congregation in the East End. And we chatted with our minister. And he said that if that was how the Lord was leading us, we should give it a go. So the first morning we went to this new church and the final hymn was, I the Lord of sea and sky with the chorus, whom shall I send? Is it I Lord? And it was actually the first time I'd ever heard that hymn, but something stirred inside of me. It felt like the Lord was giving a sign that we were going in the right direction. So moving on to the fourth, um, the fourth method, and it's perhaps similar, although actually it's a wee bit of a cheat as far as the alliteration goes, because it's circumstances, which at least sounds like an S. Sometimes op opportunities open up before us, and then sometimes they are very suddenly taken away from us. Um, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians that he planned to stay in Ephesus for a while longer because a door for effective ministry had opened up. It seemed like God had presented him with a new opportunity and he uses similar language in several of his other letters. So he decides to take this opportunity that God is giving him. Or in the reverse, come back to my example of the couple with the motorbike, the opportunity to buy that bike was actually taken away from them. They turned up the next day and it had in fact been sold. So it was clear that the Lord didn't want them to have that particular bike. And then my fifth point is saintly advice. Sometimes God uses other people to guide us with their words. But the key thing to remember with points three to five is that you need to test them with points one and two. I might feel like a sign is from God, but does my interpretation seem to be consistent with scripture? And do I have a sense in my heart that the spirit is guiding me in this way when I pray about it? And likewise with, with circumstances, with opportunities that occur, and also with what other people tell us with saintly advice. So, to try to sum this all up, it's good to turn to the Lord and seek his guidance in the decisions that we face. But when we do so, don't be like Gideon and his fleece devising a test for the Lord. But instead, use these five methods here, principally turning to scripture and listening to the spirit. But also be alert for signs, for changing circumstances and for saintly advice. And we'll need to be praying as we turn to the Lord. So let's do that just now. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that you created us to be in relationship with you. It's your desire to talk to us and to guide us. So we ask that you would help us to turn to you for guidance and to be listening and, to, and ready to receive that guidance when it comes. Whether it's through the pages of scripture, through the prompting of the Spirit, through signs that you send us, through circumstances as you open and close doors, or through the advice of others. We pray also for others who are really needing your guidance at the moment. Help them to hear your voice and follow your leading. We pray also for those who need your guidance, even though they don't know it yet. Open their hearts to you, we pray. We pray especially for those in positions of leadership as we deal with this pandemic, those who have to take decisions with enormous repercussions. We ask you to guide them, Lord. We pray we don't experience a second wave, that lives will be spared. We pray this morning for all who need your comfort in our church and in our community, those who grieve, those who are suffering from physical or mental illness or experiencing isolation or poverty, those who are lacking in hope. Lord, we pray that you would help them when that help comes through the encouragement of scripture, the peace that your spirit brings, signs that you are at work helping them, or the kind words and deeds of others. We pray that their circumstances may change for the better. Lord, we bring those who are known to us before you just now. 
in a moment of silence. Heavenly Father, receive our prayers and comfort those we have named before you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We go into the week ahead, listening for God's guidance day by day. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all, now and evermore. Amen.